he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. That's a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big deal. Aren't you thankful he didn't just leave us with a bunch of teachings? Or a philosophy, right? Or some funny poses you had to get in. Or funny clothes you had to wear. Aren't you thankful that he's actually alive, right? He didn't just leave us a book. He's actually alive. Aren't you thankful he's alive? I'm so thankful that he's living. Oh my goodness, I'm so thankful that he's living. I'm alive, I'm glad that I have a living God who still speaks and loves and saves and delivers. Still does miracles and just works in hearts in ways that people can't resist. I'm so thankful. In John chapter 20, starting at verse 30, John writes this near the end of his book. He says, therefore... Many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you may have life in His name. Say amen to the reading of the Word. Amen. Give it up for the band if you would. Come on. So anointed. So good. Like I said, this verse in uh, John... Chapter 20, go ahead and I don't know if we put it up, we can put it up. John chapter 20, uh, verse 30. This, this, uh, this, this verse comes in at the end of John's gospel. And, uh, and, and in order to really understand what he says here in verse 31, but these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. In order to understand any story, you have to understand the backstory, right? That's the story that's before the story, right? That's the story that's before the story. So here we are on Resurrection Sunday, and we're celebrating the resurrection. I'm so glad to see you all looking good today. Good looking. We got a good looking church, amen? Come on, good looking people. No, come on. Give yourself a hand. We're just, God makes beautiful things, doesn't he? Come on, tell your neighbor, God makes beautiful things. Just look at me. Look at me. But, glad okay see <laughs> but behind every story there's a backstory and behind uh, you know the story of God of course there, there's a backstory and and this story that John is talking about near the end of his story actually started a very long time ago in a garden and in the garden there was man and man lived with God and God and man lived together and there were no issues between them. There was no drama, and they were just loving on one another. There was Adam, and there was Eve, and there was no clothes, and they were just happy for some reason. (laughs) They were just living a joyful life. There was no cooking, no kitchens. They were just having a a good time. Yeah, oh yeah. Some people like, yes, that will work for me. Hallelujah. And if there's no clothes, you don't really want cooking if you think about it. That could be hazardous, I would think. Don't go there right now. That's completely not what I'm talking about. But sin entered the garden, and because there was sin in the garden, and the garden had full access to God in heaven, right? There was no separation between the the garden and heaven. They were one. And because of sin, man was separated from the garden and separated from heaven, and he was kicked out of the garden uh, because of their sin. And as time went along, a guy came named Abram. Now, Abram had an encounter with God, and and God said to Abram, we're not doing things the way other people do things. We're doing something new. We're starting over. We're going to try a new way of doing things. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, God said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now, I don't know if this jumps out at you, but when someone tells me to go somewhere, I like to know where I'm going before I start going there. Like, right? Like, God said to Abram, why don't you start going to the land that I'll show you? Like, when, when, when exactly are you showing me if I'm in the, in the, like, now would be good so I know where I'm going. And God's like, no, just go, and I'll show you. I... I don't know which direction I'm going in. And so Abram starts to walk, and Abram's going, and God is leading him. And, um, and you know, 
our nation is made of people who, who, who left somewhere to go somewhere. That, that, that's, that's who we are. And what we find in God is you have to leave what you know to find what God has for you. How I many know that? You have to leave what you know to find what God has for you. And that can be scary sometimes. Sometimes, like, all we know is what we have. And so often we'll stay in bad relationships or bad situations or bad jobs or bad cities or bad places because that's what we know. And we're worried we may not find what we're looking for. But God, in our faith in Christ, we actually have to step out of what we know, trusting God that we will wind up where He has us. I'll show you a picture here. This is the sailing ship Akona. The sailing ship Akona. This picture was taken sometime in uh, 1912 or 1913. I think maybe 1914. Uh, in November of 1915, uh, this ship was sailing from Italy uh, to the United States, and uh, it was actually sunk by a German U-boat. Uh, there was no military uh, cargo on board. There was nothing but civilians, and over 200 people uh, died on this boat leaving Italy, coming to the United States. Now, seven months earlier, there was a woman on there named Mariana uh, Lavara, which happens to be my great-grandmother. Uh, and so this is a backstory that I have. We all have a backstory. So on the Acona here, my great-grandmother, Mariana Lavara, was on there with her uh, one-year-old uh, son, uh, whose, um, whose name uh, was Fortado which is as Italian as you can get. Fortado, Lavaro, and his mom, Mariana. Like, this is as Italian as Italian gets. So they sailed over in November of 1915. And two years earlier, her husband, Diego, uh, left on a similar ship uh, from Sicily, uh, traveling to the United States. Now, back then, coming to the United States is not like traveling now. My wife and I recently went on a vacation to Panama City, Panama, and we knew everywhere we were going to eat before we even got there. Not only did we know where we were going to eat, we had looked at the menus of the... Re well, let me correct that. She had looked at the menus of every restaurant we were going to eat at. Now, I don't know how many... I, I didn't know that this was actually a thing, that there is a hobby of reading menus. I did not know that, but some people know what I'm talking about right now when I say that. You're menu readers, aren't you? Are there menu readers in the room right now? Yes, there's menu readers in the room. And that's a thing that I don't understand because I'm going to get a steak or a burger. I mean, I don't... I'm going to say, what beef thing do you have that doesn't have mushrooms? Give me that, right? I don't need a lot of description. I don't need a whole lot, but, 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 but these people left a country going to another continent, just believing that things would be better when they got there. Just the, just the promise of a better life. And that's, that's the backstory of my family. And that's the backstory of your family, because there's no indigenous people to Florida. The Seminoles moved here later, but there are no indigenous people. So if you're in Florida, this is your family story. Now, maybe your people came to the United States on purpose uh, because you were looking for a better way of life. Maybe your family came over as indentured servants. Maybe, unfortunately, the horror of slavery brought your family to the United States. But at some point, someone in your family decided to leave where they were to try a new life somewhere else in the hopes of something better. That's what unites us as Americans. We all come from people who left where they were to find something better. And this is, this is something that we should be focusing on as a nation. Amen? This is what binds us together. Instead of looking at what separates us, what binds us together? But Abraham, yeah, no, give it up. That's good. And so Abraham had a promise from God about a land. And then eventually Abraham had a promise of a son. Now, his wife and himself, they were really old and they were beyond the age of having children. And it didn't make any sense, this promise that God had given him, that they would have not just a child, but a son. And eventually, as time went on, uh, his wife Sarah, well into their 80s, got pregnant with a baby. Now, the, 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 the tradition of the land that all the gods in those days, the, the, the gods of that region, what they would tell their people, these false gods, the people would sacrifice their firstborn son 
to their God. That was standard. When your family had a firstborn son, you sacrificed it to your God in the hopes that fertility would come and that God would bless your lands. And so in that day and age, Abraham heard the same thing and he believed that God told him, I want you to go and sacrifice that firstborn son, Isaac, even though you're in your 80s and you've waited your whole life to have a child. And so Abraham and Sarah, they agreed, God, that's what we'll do. If that's what we have to do, that's what we'll do. We'll give up what we know to get what you have for me. So they got Isaac and they bound him in ropes and Isaac and Abraham took him on top of the mountain and he put him on the altar and he lifted the knife to sacrifice him and then he heard God. God said, wait a second. We're not doing things the way they've always been done. I got something better for you. Amen? Amen. So he looked over and there was a ram caught in the bush and Abraham went and got that ram and Isaac, I have no idea what that conversation was like on the way down the mountain. But Abraham grabbed that ram and he slaughtered it on that altar. And I just want you to think about that when you think that your family has issues. I want you to just keep that in mind. Like my mom didn't say I love you enough. Didn't say I just wanted her to say I love you more. Did they ever put you on an altar bound in ropes and get ready to murder you? Well, could have been worse, right? Could have been worse, right? And so, so he gave him a ram, and so it became the, the tradition. It became the standard that they would sacrifice ram and sheep, which are female rams, or you could say rams are male sheep. We can say it either way, whatever you like. That they would sacrifice these rams and these sheep to God as an offering. And, and time went on, and Abraham had Isaac, like I said, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had the... 12 children for the 12 tribes of Israel. And as time went on, they wound up in Egypt, as you know. And uh, at first, things were very good in Egypt. They, they were like the Joseph was on charge of stuff and stuff was going well and they were getting rich and rich and rich. And something happens when minorities get too powerful. People get scared. And so the Jews were getting very powerful and the Egyptians were getting scared, right? And so the Egyptians said, well, I'm not sure this is working out so well anymore, and, and, and as the, the children of, of, that it descended from Abraham uh, got more and more powerful in Egypt, the relationship went from amazing to not so good. Anybody have a relationship that went from amazing to how do I get out of this thing, right? Have you ever had a job that was going to be the great career path that turned into how can I do anything but this, right? <laughs> have you ever been in a relationship that like single and lonely would be better right now, right? Have you ever... Have you ever been in those, is it just me? Have you ever been in those relationships? I'd pretty much rather be on the backside of the desert than living with you, right? Like, <laughs> the Bible actually says better to live on the roof than with a contentious wife, but we won't go there right now. That has nothing to do with anything. So, so they're in Egypt. And uh, not this wife, not this wife, of course. A contentious wife, not one that would correct me while I'm preaching. No, that's definitely not what God is talking about. I love my wife. Hallelujah. So thankful for her. So we see that the, um, the children of Israel, the, the children of Jacob were uh, enslaved in Egypt. And we're going through the backstory right now. And so they're, they're in Egypt and they're slaves. And um, I'm not sure if, uh, if you've ever uh, seen this scripture. I'll show you in one second. But they were slaves in Egypt and Moses... Uh, was born. Now, what happened was the children of Israel were so powerful, the Pharaoh decided, we're going to begin killing the firstborn of them. There's a pattern of killing firstborn in the devil. And so they said, I'm going to begin killing the firstborn sons so that we would begin to limit their population. And there was a woman who had a baby named Moses, and she's like, I don't think I'd like to kill my child. I think I'd like him to be alive. And so she gets her boy Moses, and she puts him in a little raft, and she floats him down a river. And uh, as, time, as, as fate would have it, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh being the king, Pharaoh's daughter was out by the river and uh, she saw this baby and I believe it was the Holy Ghost put in her heart said, I think I'll raise this baby. And so Moses, who should have been murdered, was being raised in the, in the Pharaoh's house, which is pretty cool because it's probably a nice house, right? And so it's being raised in the Pharaoh's house uh, and he got to a certain age. He's like, man, I'm, 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 I'm actually an Israelite. I'm actually a Jew. I'm actually a, a child of Abraham. I'm going to go visit my people. And then he realized, man, my people aren't, aren't being treated so well. They're actually being treated quite poorly. And there was a little squabble going on between an Egyptian and, uh, and an Israelite. 
And he decided, I know, I can fix this. I'm called to deliver my people. I'll murder the Egyptian. So he kills the Egyptian, and as fate turns out, when you kill people, things don't work out that well. And so he winds up running uh, in fear into the desert, and he lives there for 40 years. Are you with me so far? So now we got Moses living in the desert for a long time. And this dream that he had in his heart that he would deliver his people comes alive again when an angel speaks to him in a bush. And he realizes, I need to go back to the most powerful country in the world and tell that most powerful country that I need you to let go of your most valuable resource, the free slave labor that you have. And, uh, and so Moses is like, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure that's a good idea, right? Like, and he starts coming up with great excuses like, I don't talk so good, right? And God's like, yeah, I don't actually need you to talk so good. I'm God. <laughs> What's going to happen is I'm going to show people I'm God through you. And it's a really funny thing happens when God calls us to do something. We think that makes us great. And God likes to call people that there's no way they could be great without God. We get a little confused on who the great one is. God has a huge call in my life. Ooh. You understand what that says about you, though, right? It's important that we get a revelation of this, right? It's important that we get a revelation of this. And Moses is like, I don't. I don't know if that's going to work out. So Moses goes back to Egypt. It's like, hey, remember me? I used to live here, and then I killed someone, and I hid for a long time. Um, I got an idea. You're free labor. How about you just let it go? And uh, Pharaoh's like, "Mm, I don't think so. How about we not do that? And he's like, yeah, I think it's really important. And Pharaoh's like, "Mm, how about we make them work harder, right? And so Moses is like, "Mm, bad idea. I'm here because God told me to come. You know, like, we've got gods too. Yes, I understand, but we have the God. (laughs) The God sent me here. Big G, right? And so the God who sent me here said the people got to go. And Pharaoh's like, eh, not so much. He says, okay, we're going to do stuff. Unfortunately, that's going to make you want to make us go. And then he did really, really what just is, if you don't read the Bible and think it's weird, you're reading the wrong book, right? And so he does stuff to make them want to make the slaves leave. Like send frogs. Who thinks of this stuff? I think I'll send frogs. Now, how many frogs do you think he sent to the point that they would give away their most valuable commodity? Can you imagine how many frogs that was? Think about, I mean, knee deep. Like how many frogs were there? It's a lot of frogs, right? And so eventually, you know, they keep upping the enemy. They keep upping the ante, upping the ante upping the ante, and, uh, and then finally, finally Pharaoh's like, okay, hey, I got an idea. I know your God said that I should let you leave to go sacrifice to your God, but here, here, I, got a, I, got a, I got a great idea. Your God's going to love this. Well, why don't you just stay here and sacrifice? And then, I don't know if you've ever seen this verse, Exodus chapter 8, verse 26. Moses says, it's not right to do so, for we will sacrifice to the Lord our God was an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice what is an abomination to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not then come want to kill us? Now, what does that mean? Next slide, please. Now, the Egyptians, I don't know if you know this or not, they worshipped rams. Their god was a ram. Catch this. God said, I know you're slaves in this land of Egypt, and what I'd like you to do is slaughter millions of what they worship. Why don't you just slaughter millions of what they worship? That ought to go well. And Moses is like, I think if we did that here, people might get upset. I'm not sure if you've seen the news, what happens when you offend the gods of the people in the Middle East, but things don't go well, generally. And so Moses is like, yeah, probably a bad idea to do it here, really think we should go. And so they went and had a little battle, and eventually, uh, you know the story, uh, They go out, and uh, Pharaoh says, you can go, and they decide, hey, we like freedom. I think we'll just keep going, right? Like, I like freedom a little bit. I think I'll like it a lot. You know, when you get a little freedom, you really don't like bondage anymore, amen? When you get a little bit of freedom. Now, if you've tasted freedom and you're now in bondage, today is a day to get free again because it's time. Come on. Come on. Come on. See, Moses was a little worried about sacrificing the things that other people worship, you know. He's like, mm, that's people, people I don't think are going to like that. But I don't know if you've noticed, but God doesn't really care about popular opinion. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed he doesn't care about See, God feels no peer pressure because he has no peers. 
He never feels peer pressure. You're never going to guilt him into doing anything because we're not his peer, right? Like, <laughs> guilt is a powerful motivator to people who think you're powerful. God doesn't find us that way. He is very secure in being God, right? And so he feels no peer pressure. He's like, I have an idea, and he calls that idea truth. <laughs> and so there's like this tension that we have to manage. Like, in following God, there's this tension. There's like, there's like following God, and then there's doing what's safe and going along with the crowd, and that is always the challenge when God speaks to us. We have to manage, am I going to follow God or am I going to stay safe with what the crowd finds acceptable? And, uh, and so they decided to follow God and they, and they ran. And as you know, you know, they got to the Red Sea and God parted it and they got through it. And as a Pharaoh's army who was chasing down um, the, the Israelites, uh, he, you know, they all got... They all got drowned and they died and that must have been an ugly scene and I don't know what happened to that water with that many dead people in it. That must have been disgusting. But uh, <clears throat> eventually they wind up in their own land and they're living in the land that God had promised them. And uh, instead of living in a land where they had to conform to other people and other people's rules and be under oppression and be slaves, now they became the powerful people. And Proverbs warns about when uh, the slave becomes king because they generally turn into tyrants. And so now they're living in a land, and, and, and God all throughout their history kept telling them, I, I need you to keep this feast. I need you to keep this festival. I need you to keep this sacrifice. I need you to remember where you came from because you weren't always powerful. You weren't always free. You weren't always in control of your own destiny. I need you to stay humble. And don't we do the same thing? Can't we do the same thing? We get a little bit of bonus and we think that we're on top of the world. We get a little bit of an advance and all of a sudden we're in charge of things. And, 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 and we can forget where we came from sometimes. Amen? We can forget how God brought us all the way here and focus on where we're not at yet. And we forget that God, where we were when we met him. We didn't really know him and we didn't have an understanding of the promises and the future. And, and God, God, God told them in these times, like, you need to remember, like, I want you to have it on your mind. We needed a deliverer. I needed to be in the midst of your assembly. I, he wanted them to stay, hear me, humble. Because God gives grace to the humble. And when we become powerful, unfortunately, after a while, we think we deserve it. We think we deserve it. We think we earned it. We think it belongs to us. And, 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 and so they're in their own land. They're in Israel. They're in, the, they're in the promised land. But yet something funny happened. God continued to promise them a savior. He continued to promise them that a rescuer would come. He said there's one that would come that is holy, who's covered in God's presence, the anointed one, the Messiah. And I got to ask you, this begs a question this morning. Why would God promise a Savior to a people who are no longer slaves and in their own land? Why would God promise a Savior, a rescuer, to a people who are no longer slaves and they were in their own land? You see, in all their power and in all their authority and all their strength, they could not see that they were poor in spirit and they were in desperate need of being rescued. Desperate need of being rescued. You remember in the garden, when they lived together with God, sin entered. And sin had terrible effects on man. It separated him. He separated, sin separated man from God. Sin separated us from each other. We began pointing fingers. No, 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 it's your fault. No, 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 it's your fault. Sin separated us from our true selves. And that's why anxiety came in and condemnation and depression and that's why these that's why that's why we begin to have self-loathing and regret and shame because of sin and sin separated us from creation we began to have to toil over the land and we began to experience sickness and and in 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 since we didn't have power over these things anymore because there was sin we began to invent things like oh 
God, nobody can really know God, or there's many ways to God, or, 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 or you know, there's always going to be troubles between men and women. I know how we'll solve that trouble. Men are in charge of women. Women are lesser than men. You're, that's, we'll stop. Here's how we stop the fighting. You don't talk back to me. These crazy things that we invent to overcome sin. And we say things like, well, you can never have perfect peace, or we say that everybody has to work, but in the absence of God, we build a worldview that accommodates sin. That's what happens. In the absence of God, we build a worldview that accommodates sin. We redefine it. We give it new words. We lessen its impact. We say it's not as big a deal. Or, or we say things like, well, I'm a good person. I've never killed anybody. And all of a sudden, the moral code comes down to if you didn't do anything, if I didn't do something, then you're a good person. You know, if it's a sin that I didn't commit, the sins that I didn't commit are the bad ones. The ones that I've committed aren't the big deal ones. And that's what we fall into. We all fall into the same trap. The sins that I've committed aren't that big a deal. The ones that I haven't done, those are the people who really need to be punished. We invent our own righteousness to accommodate sin. Or we say things like, no, it isn't really sin. There isn't really such a thing as sin. That's a man-made invention. Anybody can go to God because I've invented God. Now hear me. If you invent God, then you get to invent the way to go to Him. That's the convenience of inventing a God. The problem is any God you invent is your creation and can't save you. Only the God that created you can save you. We need a rescuer. And so Israel had this military power, and he kept telling them there, there's a better way. He kept sending prophets saying there's a better way way. There's a better life. All this fighting, all this, this, this you got to have the power. See, I, I grew up a little bit hood. Not a little bit, a lot, unfortunately. I've been trying to, my wife's been trying to drive it out of me ever since we got married. Um, and she started when we first got married by throwing away clothes that I owned. I'm like, what happened to those shorts? She's like, yeah, we don't have those shorts anymore. <laughs> What's wrong with, I don't under, I don't understand. What's, <laughs> There was a process, I didn't know, re, regeneration process. I didn't understand that I was going through. I didn't, I didn't quite get that, but I was in this process. And, you know, if, 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 if you come from the bottom, all you have is power. And that's, so that's what men try to acquire. How do I get power over other men? Serving people is not a value. Having power over other people is a value. And all People groups are stratified by who has the most power. Now, I don't know what your group looks like. Maybe the most power means the most money. Maybe the most power means you're the prettiest, or you have the nice car, or you have the big friends. I don't know what power looks like. You got the new shoes, or you got the new uh, makeup, or you got the enough followers. I don't know what power looks like in your circle, but this is what we invent when we do not have value from God. We have to invent our own value system. And so Jesus showed up. Amen. And so Jesus was telling them, hey, there's a better way of doing stuff. We're not doing stuff the way it's always been done. Jesus showed up and he started echoing some of these prophets that they didn't listen to as much. He started telling people there's a, a better way. He began to preach this message that was really foreign to the people who like power. He preached this message of peace. He started talking about love. He started saying, you actually can love people, and it caused more than a war. You actually can have peace with yourself and with God and with creation and with other people. There actually is a peace that you can have. But people missed it in the midst of their paradigm of power. They completely missed his message. And, and, and if, if you're honest, it's easy for us to miss the message of Jesus as well. As we look at the words of Jesus through the eyes of people who live in 2019, it's sometimes difficult to see. We're not a people enslaved in a land. We're not a people who are occupied by the Romans. We're not a people who can't worship our God. Jesus was talking to a people who's keeping people from worshiping. And we sometimes can't see the message he was preaching because we put ourselves in the wrong seat of who he's talking to. He really wants us to be humble, and he really wants us to be at peace. He really wants us to serve people around us. And the disciples... They, they just couldn't get it. He said really crazy, radical things like, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This was difficult for people to understand. And what Jesus was saying to these people is, hey, you're blessed because you finally see that you need to be rescued. You finally see that you need to be rescued. Amen. That's a blessing. It's a blessing when you understand that you actually need to be rescued from this world system. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And the disciples, they still didn't get it in their paradigm of power, in their paradigm of we're going to become the new Romans. We're the, we're the little people, but you're going to come and you're going to usher in this messianic kingdom and we're going to stomp everybody and we're going to destroy the Romans and we're going to rule and reign and we're going to punish God's enemies. And God's like, actually, we're going to love them. And they, and they actually couldn't get it. They didn't get it. And, and, if, and, if, and if you're honest with yourself, sometimes we don't get it. Sometimes I don't get it. Sometimes, sometimes I forget. And, and they said things like, hey, God, I, uh, Jesus, I know you're about to be murdered, uh, but when you come back and you murder all the enemies, can I sit on your left hand and on your right hand? Can we rule in power with you? He says it in Mark chapter 10, verse 37. Can we, can we rule in power with you? And Jesus is like, you don't have no idea what it's going to look like when I come into my power. And when I come into glory, you don't understand. they'd understand he'd be on a cross when he came into his glory. And there would be someone on his left and his right, and they didn't want to be that person. And so one time, Jesus tells his disciples, hey, um, I'm going to Jerusalem, but we're going to spend the night. And so go to where the, these Samaritans live and go get a house for me and, and go get a place where we can stay. And the Samaritans said, yeah, no, we don't want to give you a house. See, because the Jews and the Samaritans had beef, but Jesus reached out an olive branch and said, hey, maybe we can stay there. And so here's what the disciples actually thought how they would deal. This guy who preaches peace, how they would deal with the fact in Luke 9:54, how they would deal with this. He says, and they said, Lord. Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Shall we just murder all of them with fire? For... Now, I, have, I've, like, I read this and I think, why do they think they were able to do that in the first place? Like, had they tried that in the past and they just didn't write it in the book? Like, when they were writing the Gospels, the Holy Ghost, they're like, yeah, don't write that. That's, that's, that was a mistake. I don't... That's not really what I wanted you to do, right? Like, were they, were they, I don't understand. Like, why did they think that they could just take out a town? Why? And why did they think Jesus wanted them to do that? Like, like, right? Like, it's, it's like, and here's, here's the part that we get hung up on. Jesus is not trying to be our ticket to power and prestige. He's the gateway to heaven on earth. This is who he is. He's a gateway of heaven, which has peace in it. And you're not kicking in that door. Amen. Come on, give it up for Jesus. <clears throat> this has been his goal all along. And to gain heaven, sometimes we have to lose our earthly rights. Everything the earth says that you get, that you get to be, that you get to come, that you get to, you get to empower, that you get to overcome. The world says seize the day and, you know, only the strong survive. And, and, the, and heaven says, man, may, may, maybe that's not actually how I see things. Jesus said it this way, what is it to profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? And here's a, here's a question that really, really has to make us wonder. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? If you've not wrestled with this question, I, I, I beg you today. What will a man exchange for his soul? Because if you don't know, you've probably already exchanged it. If you've not guarded your soul, you've probably already exchanged. I'm not saying that in fear and condemnation, but if you've not guarded your soul for Jesus, you've probably exchanged it for something really stupid like sin, something really stupid like anger or greed or pornography or whatever. I don't know. You've exchanged it for something that will not last. And Jesus said, man, it's, 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 not, it's not, a, not a great exchange. And so all the, all the great military leaders all throughout history, you go to any major city in the world, Go to any major city in the world, and in the middle of the city, you're going to see a man riding a horse. A statue somewhere in a town of a man on a horse. Go to any great city in the world, you're going to go and you're going to see a man, a statue of a man on a horse. Because horses are always, no matter the religion, no matter the region, horses are known as weapons of war. They're animals of war. And there's always a man on a horse. And if you see a presidential funeral, if you look at John F. Kennedy's funeral, there was, uh, um, there was a cart pulling the casket 
with some beautiful horses pulling it. And sometimes when there's a dignitary's funeral, there'll be a, 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 a horse with no rider on it going down the street. But something different happens. When a king would come in war, he would ride a horse. When a king would come in peace, he would ride a donkey. And when you saw the king riding in on a donkey, you knew he was coming in peace. And so we see Jesus coming into town here and he's riding a donkey into Jerusalem. And you got to imagine if the disciples are saying, hey, if we're going to just stomp the Romans, how is that going to happen this way? Why are you on a donkey? You never conquer a city on a donkey. Why aren't we on our war horses? Why aren't we swinging our swords? And Jesus came really threatening the system at hand. They they murdered him because his words were so powerful that they threatened their system that they created. The gospel of peace that he preached was so threatening to them. They had to murder him. And, and I'm thankful that he was sacrificed for my sin. And that wasn't the only reason, of course, that he died. And it wasn't just the, the Romans who killed him. And there's an argument about was it the Jews or was it the Romans? And as I said on Good Friday, it was neither of them. It was me. It was my sin that nailed him to that cross. It was my sin that caused him to die because he loves me. So it's inconsequential who drove the nails and who convicted him. But him being the perfect sacrifice, we no longer need to live in a world figuring out how to accommodate sin. Through Jesus, we can live free from sin. Amen? Jesus was born from a virgin. He didn't have an earthly father because sin in the Bible was passed down through the father's line. And so he had no earthly father. He was born from a a virgin woman. And he lived with no sin. And he lived his life as a gospel of peace. And when he was 30, he was anointed, was baptized, and he began to preach the gospel. And about the age of 33 or so, he was murdered. He was murdered and he was nailed to a cross and his blood dripped down that cross and they buried him in a tomb. And I asked on Friday, you know, he, we know he rose from the dead, but why did he have to rise from the dead? He could have just gone straight to heaven. He had never sinned. There was no need to come back and prove anything to us. Uh, we never saw Jonah in the belly of the beast and we never saw God create the earth and We never saw so many things that we just believe in the word, but Jesus had to come back in the flesh because the altar had been sullied by the sin of Adam. And there was a representation of it on earth that the bulls and the goats and the rams and the pigeons were sacrificed before and the blood were on top of, but something had to happen to that altar in heaven. And Jesus rose from the dead and went to that altar in heaven. He ministered his own perfect blood, washing it clean and 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 in the past God would look past that altar and see us and then he would have to see the blood of bulls and goats covering that sin but now when he looks at the altar in heaven it's completely washed clean by the blood of Jesus Jesus made the way for you to have peace he made the way for you to have peace with God he made the way for you to have peace with other people he made the way for you to have peace with yourself. You made the way for you to have peace with creation. God made a way for you to have peace through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said it in John 16, 33. He said, these things I have spoken to you so that in me, listen, you may have, let's say it together, peace. In the world you have troubles, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Can you say amen? Come on, can you say amen? Amen. He's alive. He's alive, amen? Amen. He's alive and he's active and he's working on our behalf right now. But none of this means anything if you don't believe. Now you may believe, but it doesn't mean you believe. There's a difference between belief and faith. There was a man in the early 1900s, he was called the Great Blondin. Anybody heard of him? The Great Blondin. I got a picture of him for you. Good looking guy. The Great Blondin. And he would walk on a tightrope over Niagara Falls. And they would charge admission to watch the Great Blondin walk over Niagara Falls. And after a while, as 
bizarre as this sounds, that wasn't enough. People got tired of Blondin walking over the Niagara Falls. They kind of knew he could do it. And so he, he, instead of using that balancing pole that the tightrope walkers use, he would began using a wheelbarrow. Instead of the balancing pole, he'd use a wheelbarrow. And he asked the crowd, he said to the crowd, hey, who believes that I can walk over this tightrope using a wheelbarrow? And the crowd's hand would go up. Yes. He'd say, who believes that I can walk over this Niagara Falls with a wheelbarrow? And they'd put their hands up. And he'd say, excellent. Now, which one of you wants to get in the wheelbarrow? And all the hands would go down. <laughs> See, they believed that he could walk across Niagara Falls with the wheelbarrow, but they had absolute faith, zero faith that they would sit in the wheelbarrow to do it. And we go back to our scripture we first talked about. John chapter 20, verse 30. John had written an entire book. He lived with God, and he had lived with Jesus on earth, and he'd become a wise man, and he wrote this entire story of Jesus' life, and eventually he writes this near the end of the book. He says, but these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, hear this, believing you may have life in his name. Peter, when talking about his relationship with Jesus and how the Father spoke over him, this is my beloved son, he says this in 2 Peter 1.18, we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. It's my hope that this may be a holy mountain today and that you hear that utterance from heaven, that you are a son of God, that you are a daughter of God, and that you are well-pleasing to the God who created you, that he loves you, and that he's come, that you may have peace with God. You see, Jesus was going to be the conquering king for the disciples. You were going to overthrow Rome, and you were going to make us all powerful. Can you turn that down one touch, please? You're going to make it all powerful, but Jesus got beat down. He literally got beat down all over Jerusalem. He caught a beat down. All over Jerusalem, they humiliated him. They whipped him. They beat him. They humiliated him. They mocked him. They made fun of him. Now, I told you earlier, I grew up a little hood, right? And in the hood, like, you're only as big as you can talk, as you can back up your talk. And you don't want to talk too much if you can't back it up. And some of us around here who grow up, we have a little saying. We say, you know, you could tell that person's never been punched in the mouth, right? Because if you've been punched in the mouth, you wouldn't talk that way. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There's something that you learn at the wrong end of a beatdown, right? You learn how to talk to people. And I, unfortunately, have caught the wrong end of a few too many beatdowns in my life. And uh, maybe it's because my mouth was a little stronger than my fist. And... <clears throat> But the thing about catching a beatdown is it's hard to show your face afterwards. Because in a certain population of power dynamics, when you no longer have power, you no longer have faith. You don't have face anymore. You don't have authority. You don't have dignity. You, it's been taken away from you. And so here's Jesus in the midst of a power dynamic who not only was murdered, he was humiliated all over Jerusalem, didn't fight back once. And he shows up on the scene and he and he talks, to, he talks to Peter, and he's basically saying, Peter, am I enough for you, or do you need this world as well? Am I enough, or do you need what the Romans have as well? He says it to him in John chapter 21, 15. He says, when they'd eaten some breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And he said, tend my lambs. And Jesus, not worried about getting awkward, asked the same question. Again, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. And they say in uh, church growth strategy, you never want to make anyone awkward in service. You want to make us a new... And we have just completely disregarded that entirely. It's our hope and our prayer that God would make it awkward for people regularly and force us to come into His best. Amen? I want to make it awkward with us living in our pain, awkward living in our sin, awkward living short of our best. 
I want him to make it awkward. And so Jesus asked the same question a third time. He said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved. I want you to remember that. He was grieved. And he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. Now, a lot of theories on why Jesus said this three times. But let me, let me tell you this. Peter, supposed to be the the star pupil, the star disciple, the rock that the entire, this whole thing was going to kind of be shepherded by. And in this, the, the Greek that this was written in, the word love is written many different ways. In English, we have love and maybe we have like. But there's only love. And in Greek, there's many ways to say love. And the highest form of love, many of you know this, is agape. And agape is this unconditional love that requires nothing of the other person. It's just wholehearted, full on, without reservation, just all out love, nothing being held back. Agape is a love that just comes at you and expects nothing in return. It is just whole and it's beautiful and it's pure. And they had a lower form of love that was called phileo. And it means like a brotherly love. And This is what the name, the city Philadelphia was named after. Phileo, Philadelphia. And that's why they call it the city of brotherly love. Because it's a brotherly love. And when you read this passage between Jesus and Peter in the Greek, it doesn't sound the same as it does in English because Jesus in verse 15 says, Simon, son of John, do you agape me more than all of this? And Peter in his broken state and his disappointment and his hurt and his confusion and maybe even his shame at denying Jesus says, Jesus, i got to be real. I phileo you. And so Jesus asked him again, verse 16, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? The first time he said, you agape me more than all this and Peter said, I phileo you. And he says, okay, you just agape me. And Peter says, Lord, I can't lie to you. I phileo you. And Jesus, in all his awe, in all his love, in all his wonder, who came from heaven and died for all of us, then turns to Peter and says, Peter, do you phileo me? Peter says, yes. Jesus says, I'll take that. I'll take the love you can give me. You don't have to come to me perfect. You don't have to have it figured out. But I want you to know that I love you. I love you. And I just want to have a love relationship with you in return. I'll take you in your brokenness. I'll take you in your shame. I'll take you in your failings. I'll take you in your shortcomings. I'll take you at your worst. I just want to love you. And I don't know where you're at in your journey with Jesus this morning. I don't know where you're at. I don't know maybe... You've struggled in your relationship with God. I don't know, maybe you thought that everything was perfect, but maybe today you realize there's more to the relationship than you thought. And God is actually looking for something in return. Today it's my unreserved, unashamed heart that you would come to Jesus with what you can give Him today that you would give an offering of humility, an offering to Jesus of your brokenness, of your hurt, of your pain, of your love, of your best and of your worst. Stand with me. I love to pray. As the ministry team comes forward, we're going to worship in a moment, but I want to pray first. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for this agape love that you have for us. So amazing that you sent your Son from heaven And Jesus, you're so amazing that you left heaven for us. Could have stayed there where it was perfect, but you left for us. You came to reach out to us, to extend a hand, to send love. 
to extend mercy even when we could not return it to you. I want to ask you this morning, is it possible? Is it possible that you're at a place that you can finally say, I need to be rescued from my sin. I see the effects in my life. I see the effects in my life and I'm ready to turn my life to Jesus. I'm ready to receive the love that He has for me. Let's all pray together if you would bow your head. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we love You. We adore You. We're thankful for You and for Your life today. I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray that this will be a room full of believing and that some will leave where they're comfortable from to go for what you have for them. I pray that they would see this as a, a church of life where they can grow and flourish in their relationship with God, that they can know God better and meet people who know God and grow with them. Father, I pray that we will be a family of believers who honors your name and honors your sacrifice. And I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that no one would leave today until they get this one thing settled. That they would be assured of their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, we're about to go back into worship. I want you to stay. I want you to sing with us. And if at any point you want to come forward to receive prayer, to get right with God, to correct your relationship with God, to make sure you're right with God, our prayer partners up front would love to pray for you. But we're going to go into worship and we're going to sing this with all that we have because we are so thankful. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hey, before, before you go today, before you go and you hang out with family, before you gather around the table and, and eat steak and salad, whatever you got planned, I'm sure it's amazing. I know I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I want to share with you a story that happened in, in, in my home this week. You know, and, um, uh, I, have a, I have a three-year-old son and a one-year-old daughter, and when, when my daughter goes down for a nap, uh, my, my beautiful wife likes to draw with my son. And uh, it's one of the things that keeps them quiet, you know, so she can sleep. Um, so this week they're sitting at the table, and it was actually on Good Friday, and they're drawing, they're practicing doing his, his name, they're practicing doing letters, and she said, he says, he says, he says, Mommy, I, 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 I want you to draw that thing. And she says, well, 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 what thing are you talking about, Noah? And he says, I want you to draw that, that thing from, from church, remember? And he's referring to something they had learned last Sunday in Revival Kids. He's, she said, then you, you, mean, you mean the cross? He said, yeah, the cross, I want you to draw the cross. And now she began to draw the cross. My wife could feel the, the Holy Spirit in the room and God was doing something. And, and then he said, Mommy, I want you to draw Jesus. And she said, okay. And she began to draw him. He said, no, no, I want you to draw him on the cross. And then he said, I want you to draw those other things, Mommy. And, and, and it took her a little bit to figure out what he was talking about. But he was talking about the nails and his hands and his feet. I said, I want you to draw the nails, Mom. That's, that, that's, that's what I want you to draw. I want you to draw the nails. And then, and then he proceeded to draw the, the cross to his left and the cross to his right. And you could see in that moment, something was happening. She could see something happening in my son, something happening in this little three-year-old. And I, again, don't know where you're at today, but God, Jesus tells us to come to him like a child. 
And no matter what you're dealing with today, do not leave here. Do not leave here. If you don't know him, do not leave here without getting right with Jesus because he's here and he loves you and he wants to meet you. Amen? If that's you today, you can come on forward and we just want to bless you guys. Next week, we're having our 10th anniversary barbecue. We're going to have some good food. We're going to hang out together. We have a 10 a.m. One service at 10 a.m. So come hang out with us again next week because we want to hang out with you. Amen? You guys can sign up to bring something out in the lobby. But God bless you. We're going to continue to worship. Have an amazing Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. Come on forward and get prayer. Don't leave here without getting right with Jesus. Amen. Come on, give it up one more time.